Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Today, we're going to have a discussion that will resonate with many property investors. You see, we all have limits to our budget, and I know many investors have to make the decision. Should you invest in an investment-grade apartment in a prime location or a house in a secondary location? Obviously, each option has got its own benefits and challenges, and choosing the right one can significantly impact your investment returns. To help us navigate this decision, I'm joined by my regular guest, Stuart Weems, founder of ProSolution Private Clients. And I'm going to ask him, what makes an investment grade apartment, the critical role location has got in your investment decisions, and how to balance capital growth, rental yield, and location. We're also going to explore market trends, tenant preferences, and long-term investment strategies to help you determine which option might best align with your financial goals. So, let's get to the heart of the matter. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Most investors would prefer to buy a house with the associated land component rather than an apartment. But most investors are also limited by their budget. So many have had to grapple with the question, should I buy an investment-grade apartment in a prime location or a house in, in a secondary location? Obviously, this decision can shape your property portfolio and your long-term financial success. Now, independent financial advisor Stuart Weems, founder of ProSolution Private Clients, has written a great blog explaining his thoughts about this. So I'm keen to ask him some questions about it. Hi, Stuart. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks, Michael. This is going to be a really interesting discussion, I think, because it's a question that I'm sure both of us get asked all the time. Yes, I do. We do do that. And because most people like the idea of house, house and land, but we know that not all land is created equal. Not all houses are the same. But I think in general, the consensus is that if you can afford a house in a good location, it's going to provide a superior in investment. Would that be right? Look, I think so. Uh, holding everything equal, a uh, house will be a better investment, typically because it has a higher land value component, or at least an investment grade house does. And obviously, land appreciates over time. I mean, buildings, and we've talked about that, this in this podcast before, buildings can appreciate as the cost to replace increases, but certainly not to the same extent as land. And land is the scarce asset, right? Building will cost more to to replicate a, a dwelling in 20 years, of course, but the land will cost a lot more in 20 years than it does today. Clearly. So we talk about investment grade a lot in our chats. What would in your mind then be an investment grade apartment? And how does it differ from the typical apartment? We've started off by talking about land value, and that's the common theme. The land value in a property, in a house, for example, is really obvious, right? We can walk through it. We can see it. It's on a separate parcel of land. The house is in the middle of the block or whatever it might be. It's very obvious. We don't necessarily, or people assume, we don't really get that land value with apartments, but we, and sometimes we don't. But with older style apartments, typically they're, you know, on a pretty large block, six, 700 square metres. They might have been built in the earlier 20th century, sort of in the 50s, 40s, 30s, whatever it might be. It might be a block of four or six or eight apartments. But on that block today, if if a developer rebuilt that, they'd be building probably north of 20 apartments. You know, it'd be a, a lot more dense than what it is. And so this apartment block sits on a very valuable parcel of land. You know, if it's in a good location, a good street and so forth, and so you do have an attributable land value as a, an apartment holder because if you're one of four on that block, well, then you've got, have got a quarter of that land value and that's really what's going to appreciate and, and drive that future value because the building's probably depreciate as much as it needs to. It, it is what it is. And, and maybe in a way, if it's a particular architectural style, maybe it is appreciating a little bit, but really it's the land that you're buying if you're buying an investment-grade apartment. So these are older-style apartments. 
typically don't have a huge amount of amenities, you know, lifts and pools and gyms and those sorts of things which are expensive for investors to maintain. They'll tend to be quite solid, you know, double brick, more spacious than the newer style apartments. Now they Better floor plans too. Many of them have an entry hall. In the new house uh, apartments, you sort of fall straight into the living area as you walk through the front door. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're older, you know, they, they creak and they might have drafts and, and these sorts of things. So there's pros and cons. But from an investor perspective, most of the value is represented in land value, which is more than 50% of the values representing underlying a land value. And you can often see that anyway when you get the rating certificate, the council rating certificate, you can see what they attribute to, to the land component. And currently in Melbourne in particular where apartments have underperformed, you can virtually buy them, well, you definitely buy them below replacement cost because all new apartments are going to cost so much more to build, but you can often buy them almost close to land value. So... If we understand that some apartments are investment grade and others aren't, the other fact that you mentioned it a moment ago is land, but it's also where the land's located. How important is location when considering an investment property? And can an investment grade apartment in that good location outperform a house in a secondary location? Yeah, I mean, we're all familiar with the term location, location, location. Obviously, location has a a really big impact. I'd reframe the question, Michael, should I buy a house regardless of its, over an apartment, regardless of its location? Well, I think it would be obvious, you know, using basic logic, it would be obvious to most people, the answer is no. At some point, an apartment's going to be a better option than a house, particularly if you're compromising more and more on the locality. So would you like to own a house in the middle of the desert, the Nullarbor? versus an apartment in a capital city. Well, they're two very stark, obvious comparisons. Of course, everyone, an investor is going to go, let's let's take the apartment in the city. Where that cutoff is in terms of comparing, that that's what we can talk about and debate. That's It's a difficult question though, like how far out do you need to go before you start saying, well, I'm not going to buy a house anymore because my budget doesn't allow me, I want to buy an apartment, which is kind of the whole thesis around the the blog, Michael, is if we have unlimited borrowing capacity, of course, let's go and buy a house in a blue chip location. It's a no-brainer. But if we have a limited borrowing capacity where we've got to go further out, you know, we've got to go 30 Ks out of the CBD or maybe even further to be able to afford a house, should I do that? Or should I just go and buy a, an apartment in a location where I don't need to make any compromises in terms of location? It's blue chip. Well, there's also a middle ground, isn't there? There's townhouses, which in my mind are going to become a more preferred style of accommodation for a lot of people because they're the more modern and larger accommodation, but on a compact block. And then there's also villa units. And in my mind, the right sort of villa unit, because of the location where they were built, could also make a good investment. And they have quite a significant land component, often a third or a fourth of the land yeah, and I think villa units might, can make a really great investment. Well, now we've got to be careful. A lot of those villa units are often built on busier main roads. So you want to be careful about, I mean, you don't want to be necessary in that situation at the front of the the block if there's three villa units, for example. And, and just to explain, a villa unit typically is a standalone unit. I mean, it's smaller than a house, of course, located on a pretty large block and you might find three or four or something. Typically, there's a driveway that goes up the side or even sometimes in the middle of the block. And so everyone has their little bit of land. They might have a little bit of a backyard, very tiny, but a little bit of outdoor area. And then a very small two bedrooms kind of house, if you like, but it's a, a villa unit. That's the style of accommodation we're talking about. And naturally, it's kind of a compromise in between, you know, having a, a house, a family home on a normal size block versus having an apartment. Well, they were built uh, in particular for retirees, old houses were pulled down in great locations and uh, in the 60s and 70s, developers built these uh, single-storey buildings and they, in general, don't have en-suites like we'd have today. They often have single garages. They've only got small yards. But, Stuart, I found they're particularly popular amongst young families to get into good locations, young families because they don't have to pull prams and pushes up the stairs and for all sorts of people because you don't have a neighbour in front, you know, on one side or the other, you're not sharing walls. And in general, there's actually very little common area. So there's no big owner's corporation costs. So you usually, usually only the, the, the small common driveway and maybe the, the lawn out the front. 
Yeah, exactly right. I think they do make really good investments. As I said a compromise between house and apartment, and so it, it's worthwhile mentioning them in this in this conversation, of course. Sure, but over the last couple of years, apartments haven't performed as well. Look, we know that partly during COVID, people uh, didn't want to share common facilities. And more recently, particularly in Melbourne, and you've written some great blogs about it, and we've discussed it before, apartments have underperformed. And as we said, we can now buy them considerably below replacement cost. In my mind, if you've got the long-term perspective, that creates a window of opportunity. People who buy the right location, a well-located established family-friendly apartments are likely to do well over the medium to long term, even though by the end of the year, they'll probably find that houses have done better. It's back to the old story we've discussed in previous blogs. You've actually got to have a long-term focus rather than a short-term focus. Yeah, I think that's the key here, you know, to buy something that's that's unpopular where and apartments are so popular at the moment, particularly from an investor standpoint, because the returns haven't been there over the last decade, particularly in Melbourne, Sydney's not done too bad. And, you know, Brisbane apartments are starting to really pick up and have picked up over the last couple of years. So the theme is a little bit easier, I guess, in those other geographical locations. But we've got to remember that what we're trying to do is buy a, a property asset, one that's going to give us the highest average return over the next 20 plus years. So we're not the highest return over the next two years or five years or even 10 years. It's really what's going to give me the highest return over 20 years. And the things that we want to think about then, whether it's an apartment or a house or a villa unit, I think the things that we want to think about is how will congestion change over that period of time? Because obviously as our capital cities grow and Melbourne can grow, it can grow out, Sydney not so much because it's bordered by national parks and water and so forth. And Brisbane to some extent can grow as well. And so it's a natural thing for us to want to do. Obviously as our population grows, we, we need to grow the, the city. It will spread out further. But of course we all know, <laughs> particularly in Victoria, they can't build infrastructure either fast enough or, or cheaply enough for it to accommodate that growth, right? So we're, we're typically completely underplanned for infrastructure. In fact, by the time Victoria finishes the, their infrastructure projects, they'll probably be redundant. That just means as property investors and from a livability perspective, living 30Ks, 40Ks out from the CBD will be a different proposition than what it is today. And particularly in comparison to living closer to the CBD. So at the moment, and I don't have a lot of stats to frame this idea or hypothesis, Michael, but at the moment, I think property in locations that are 20, 30 Ks away from the CBD are quite expensive for what they are, particularly in comparison to properties that are in blue chip locations. Maybe it's because they're shiny and new, you know, maybe that's the sort of attraction, if you like, maybe because they're heading into a particular affordability range. My view is that we want to think about the quality of the land that we're owning, whether it's an apartment, as I said, or a, or a house, and how that quality might become scarcer or in higher demand over the next couple of decades, not the next couple of years. And that's the that's kind of the difficult thing to do because you've got to get your head around it and you've got to force yourself to be really long-term. Well, one of the factors we look at when we want to recommend a property to clients is the walk score. In other words, how convenient is things? COVID brought that home. The concept of a 20-minute neighbourhood being able to walk, cycle, ride, drive close to a whole lot of amenities and to the right sort of infrastructure and also jobs. And that's getting harder and harder in those outer suburbs. There's a tendency for investors to like the concept of buying house and land packages. The problem is uh, there's abundant supply of land, especially in Melbourne, as you suggested, in Brisbane, which is sort of working its way from Brisbane all the way down to the Gold Coast in the south and the Sunshine Coast up in the north. And abundant supply is the enemy of capital growth. So I agree with you, investors should really prioritise the location of the investment as it directly influences the supply and demand fundamentals. I've been seeing, unfortunately, a lot of spruikers and property marketers get investors and naive investors into house and land packages. They're doing a couple of things. They're actually getting the investors to buy the land and then fund the builder 
to build the property on it and they're paying a fee for people to put these deals together for them, Stuart. It's just not doesn't make sense to me. No, I mean, again, it might work in the short term. Sometimes I've seen these house and land packages, particularly if you buy the first stage or second stage release of the land, you know, you can get it a bit cheaper compared to what um, subsequent stages will sell at. And you might see a little bit of initial capital growth, particularly as the area kind of, they attract a supermarket, a doctor's surgery and these sorts of things, it starts to sort of build up. It's a short-term sugar hit. You, you'll get maybe get that, maybe get that initial growth, but it's not going to outperform over a 20-year period. It just doesn't have the fundamentals in order to do that. But if I'm a property advocate or advisor or spruker, it's an easy sell. It's a really easy sell to say, hey, look, I've sold 10 of these and a year ago when these people are sitting on $150,000 of equity. And I see it too on social media as well, people advertising, we bought this property three years ago and this is the equity. Fantastic. That's good. I'm very happy for those people. But will it be an asset What that's going to outperform over the next 20 decades? Because that's the key. There's a lot of hassle to sell and rebuy. You, you don't want to necessarily do that. You're triggering costs, tax, all that sort of fees, advisory fees, all that sort of stuff. It's unnecessary. What we want to do is buy a really good quality asset, which you know leads into this discussion, Michael. Because if someone has a a finite budget, we've all got a finite budget. You know, a budget that doesn't necessarily lend them allow them to go and buy a house in a blue chip location. Um, it is really difficult. I'm, I imagine it would be very, very difficult, and you get very confused because there's a million different opinions out there on what is best in terms of the best type of asset to buy. I think a couple of other factors to consider are the demographics of the tenants. And it's not a judge of people, but in the outer suburbs, there's going to be a lot of young families. And in the future, your income, if you're buying property to, in the future, give you residual passive income, that's, your income is going to be dependent upon your tenant's ability to keep paying rent and keep paying higher rent over time. So I like the concept that there are more affluent tenants in the middle and inner ring suburbs of our capital cities than the outer suburbs where a lot of people are really living month to month, paycheck to paycheck. Stuart, the other factor is that over the next years, we are going to build a lot more medium density and high density apartments. I'm not suggesting they should be investments, but what they're going to be doing is dragging up the value of established apartments. It's been written often and we've spoken about that that the cost of developing a new apartment block is probably going to be 40% more than it was at the beginning of COVID. In other words, end values are going to have to increase substantially to make them even financially viable. And that's why very few developers are taking the risk at the moment and why buyers aren't buying off the plan and getting the developments out of the ground. But eventually this cycle will pick up. The only time that will happen is when established apartment prices increase enough to make new developments viable. We've been around long enough, Stuart. We've seen that cycle before. That will happen. And so I see a great window of opportunity. Not that we try to time the market, but if if, if the market's handing you the opportunity to buy below replacement cost, below intrinsic value, why not do it? Yeah. If you can buy a good long-term asset, and I underline good long-term asset cheaply, of course, your returns are going to be much better off. Now, the price you pay for a good long-term asset uh, is, isn't that important. You can even overpay for a good long-term asset. You hold it for long-term, you'll be okay. But this is where the opportunity is. If you can buy it cheaply, it's quite possible and, in fact, probable that your returns in the early years of that investment will be above average as well, which makes everyone feel a little bit happier and, and more comfortable. Thinking about relative value, I think, is important in this conversation as well, because if I've got limited dollars to deploy, I want to get the best bang for buck. And so the question that I want to then ask myself is, if I go and buy a house and land package, or I go and buy a house in a in an outer suburb, how do I feel about the relative value of that, you know, in terms of what I'm getting and how much I'm paying? You know, I might feel like, okay, I can get a house for $800,000, but I'm still like, far out from the CBD that doesn't, you know, doesn't have the amenity and the livability that, you know, something closer in does. And the thing that really surprises me, for example, is uh, my wife's got some family in Shepparton and to buy a a family home in Shepparton, even in a sort of a new area, you're spending 800 to a million dollars. How in the hell does it cost 800 to a million dollars to live in, in Shepparton? So people that 
don't know Victoria well, it's about two hours away, two hours north of Melbourne. So, so certainly uh, far away. If there's a property bubble in Australia, if there is, it's in those locations, not in inner city locations. And I think, I think when you compare that to, say, a two-bedroom apartment in East Melbourne, one looks like, to me, really great value. The other one looks overpriced. And, and so uh, uh, helping you, like if you got that limited budget, one of the things you need to do is kind of weigh up subjectively the intrinsic value of these different investment options and if you can choose the option that looks like the best value but still is a good long-term investment chances are that's the best way I think to mitigate underperformance that is to mitigate the risk that you buy this asset or invest in this asset and you're not going to be happy with the returns. Now if somebody came to Australia from overseas hadn't been here for 10 years they wouldn't recognize our skyline there's lots of apartment buildings that were built and nothing much new in the last couple of years but uh, that they were built a while ago and the skyline has changed and if they were to come back in another decade there's going to be again significant changes as our governments are encouraging more medium and high density developments. If you think about it, we're probably going to have another million people in the next three years, another million people for the next three years after that, and again, f- further million people. And they're all going to be wanting to live in general in the same five big capital cities, and most of them in three of the big capital cities. Um, there's going to be lots more cars on the road, congestion is going to get more, uh, as we've said. So location, the right sort of location, the right neighbourhoods are going to become more important. So I think the lesson from this is be careful in what you buy and only buy quality assets as we've discussed in previous shows. That's going to be the major factor in your long-term wealth creation rather than short-term gains or short-term returns, Stuart. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, taking that long term view. And for a new investor, that can be more difficult to do. Of course, we've seen the property cycles, we've been in it for many decades, Michael. So I think it's natural. And we've got that confidence that these are the things that we really want to think about and consider because we've seen how over the last couple of decades, you know, the livability of those inner city locations in blue chip suburbs have have really thrived compared to the outer locations. Um, It's interesting. I think the work from home thing delayed that process a little bit in that, you know, I know my wife's got a friend that moved to Australia from Italy and during COVID she thought, oh, we'll just move further out. It's cheaper rent. We'll get a, a larger house. You know, we can work from home anyway so the travel time doesn't really worry us. Well, uh, fast forward a, a couple of years and, you know, she works in St Kilda Road. Her employer wants to come in more often and now the travel time is a, a nightmare and they're going to move back into the city. And I, I think the similar sort of theme with, you know, the the move out into beachside and treeside locations as well. It's good for a couple of years. It, it suits some people and it's perfect for some people, but other people, they're going to think, oh, it's a bit boring. There's not enough going on here. Let's get back into the capital cities. At the end of the day, and I'll say, we we're both saying this during that, that period and during COVID, at the end of the day, for hundreds of years, we've all congregated close to each other in capital cities because we want that community. We want that vibe. We want that the ability to do different things entertainment wise and restaurants and schooling and job opportunities, all those sorts of things, that's not going to change. And it will be the same in 20 years from now. And those, those, uh, the properties that are really going to benefit from that excessive demand, because that's obviously what you want is you want a property in an area where it's, where you've always, people always want to buy it. And there's a, a cohort of, of potential buyers for that asset that were, they're able to pay more. And if you can be in that location, you're going to enjoy above average capital growth over many decades. Well, I can imagine that this is going to be a discussion that we're going to have again over time because people are always wanting to allocate their assets in the best way and we've all got preconceived ideas. But I'm sure that you're giving evidence and fact-based approach. That's why I love having these regular chats. I know that's what you do with your clients for ProSolution, private clients as well. You provide what I know you call a holistic approach. So for those who don't know what you do, could you just give us a quick rundown, please? Michael, we think that we can harness the most amount of value by 
uh, making sure we take a holistic approach because a lot of financial decisions are multifaceted in that they there's tax considerations, borrowing considerations, financial planning. So if we can get a mortgage broker, an accountant, and a financial advisor in a room together to talk about a particular client's circumstances, we can harness the most amount of value because we know things that clients don't know and, and the client realizes that they only need to tell us one thing once and we already understand their situation so we can workshop those ideas. And and so we work with clients, develop an initial plan, then work with them to implement that plan successfully over time. Well, I'll leave a link to your weekly blog, uh, podcast and uh, Pro Solution Private Clients in the show notes. And I look forward to catching up with you again in about a month's time, Stuart. Thanks, Michael. It's been fun as always. My pleasure. Well, Stuart and I covered a lot, but I think one of the underlying themes that we were trying to get across to you was the importance of owning quality investment grade assets. And I'd like to explain that in a bit more detail in just a second. But before I do, I just want to remind you that if you don't currently follow or subscribe to this show and you're getting some benefit from the information we're giving you, please just stop for a second and subscribe or follow whichever podcast app you're listening to this on or on if you're watching on YouTube, you're listening to the audio on YouTube, Boy, a lot of people are doing that. Please just uh, click and subscribe. That way, twice a week, you'll get the information from my guests and me. But we were talking about how do you know what's an investment-grade asset? And at the moment, your inbox is probably inundated with offers teaching you how to become financially free through property. There are webinars, masterclasses, property gurus, and a new band of buyers agents all telling you how well the property market's performing, and they're going to help you find an investment-grade asset. Look... The last couple of strong years have meant a whole generation of new property experts have emerged, and they're now recommending, encouraging you to come along and listen to their theories. However, the problem is, for those interested in property, the changing markets at the moment mean it's really important for you to receive unbiased advice. There's no property boom at the moment, and there are multiple and very fragmented property markets, so it's really hard to know who to listen to, isn't it? Now, sure, I'm biased, and I'd like you to work with my team at Metropole, but we've got no properties for sale. We've got on-the-ground teams in the three largest property markets in Australia. We've got all the research data available on properties going back 45 years, but more importantly, we've got the perspective to understand what it all means. And by now, if you've been listening to me, you'd know that we're much more than just another bias agent. We help our clients safely outperform the markets, and we help them create intergenerational wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. So why not lock in a time for a complimentary wealth discovery chat with one of the Metropole Wealth Strategists to discuss your options? Just go to metropole.com.au. There's a link in the show notes, but I believe it's going to be a great investment in your time. We understand and we know what makes investment great properties. A recent audit of the results of our clients showed they're 7.3 times more likely than the average investor to own six or more properties. I guess they made the right decisions because they got the right advice. So why not get the same information and see what your options are? Go to metropole.com.au and lock in a time for a complimentary wealth discovery chat with one of our wealth strategists. Let's discuss your options. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. I write a lot about money and property in my blogs. I discuss it in my podcasts. But when you get to know me, you'll realize that I believe true wealth is what you're left with when they take away all your money. Sure, money is important in some aspects of your life, but it's not important in others, is it? So in today's Mindset Moment, I'd like to share with you a list of things that you'll regret. You'll regret in the future if you don't do them now. It's a way of me emphasizing the point that money is important in those areas where it's important and not at all important in other areas of your life. So number one, put your health and wellness above everything else. There's an old saying, if you don't have your health, you have nothing. I think that's true. Number two, take the time to do the things that you love. Now, this may sound cliche, but work less and play more. You'll never regret taking a vacation, engaging in a new hobby, or spending a day with those who make you happy. The third thing I'd like to remind you is to stop 
taking life so seriously? Why are you taking it so seriously anyway? When you think about it, most of the things you've worried about in the past never really occurred, did they? The fourth thing I'd like to share with you is always say what you need to say. If you love somebody, tell them. If somebody hurt you, tell them. If you've got trouble expressing your feelings, write a letter, do an email. Make sure that those around you know each and every day how you feel. The fifth lesson is open up your mind to possibilities. If you have a closed mind, if you stay in your comfort zone, You'll never get to the next level. You'll never truly enjoy life. The sixth lesson I'd like to share is follow your own path. Live a true life, one that's true to you. Stop comparing yourself to other people and stop trying to be a perfectionist. Stop living a life based on the expectation of others or what you think others are achieving. Because when you look at Facebook and you look at Instagram, you're seeing their highlight reel. You're not seeing all the bits on the cutting room floor. Another lesson to know is stop living in the past. Right now, you need to throw away the regrets from the past. It's gone. There's no point dwelling on what could have been. Doing so is only going to rob you of the the joy of what's happening at the moment. The past doesn't exist other than a memory. It's a mental story. And it can't be changed, so move on. I guess that brings me to the next lesson. Accept the things you can't change. Lesson nine I'd like to share with you to show you that there are 12 things at least that are more important than money is practice mindful living. Mindful living will slow down time. It will enhance the present moment. It'll fill what could have otherwise been mundane days with awe and with joy. Appreciate what you've got. Be grateful for what you've got. The 10th lesson is stop chasing money, fame and possession. I know we crave wealth, prestige, fame and popularity. We crave material things, beautiful people, the next big toy, the shiny object. We mistakenly think that happiness is going to arrive when we meet these goals. Instead of enjoying our life, we seem to be in constant pursuit of something other than what we've already got, what we've got right now. At the end of your life, your expensive BMW, that's not what's going to be flashing through your mind. You're more likely going to be remembering about the memory of a a loyal dog or a loved one. So stop chasing material possessions. There's no real happiness there, only an endless pursuit. And another lesson I'd like to mention to you is always practice gratitude. I've already said it briefly before, but you'll never ever be wealthy if you're not grateful for what we've got and you live in the best country in the world, the best time in history. Enjoy it, appreciate it. And the last thing that's more important than money is love. Pay attention to all the sources of love in your life and you'll develop a growing sense of abundance of how much beauty surrounds you each day. So remember, there are many things in this life more important than money. Thank you for spending the last little while with me. I hope you got some benefit from this show. Hey, but before you move on to the next podcast you're hoping to listen to, please let me remind you that I have another show that I produce once a week with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher that we call Demographics Decoded, where we unveil the trends that are going to shape your future. This is a must-listen-to podcast for anyone interested in property investment, business, or entrepreneurship. So if you don't currently subscribe to Demographics Decoded, please stop for a second and subscribe on your favourite podcast app or on YouTube. Now, if you did enjoy today's show and you know somebody else who'd benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast and Demographics Decoded. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there are three little buttons at the top of the player. Or just talk to them, tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour. You're definitely going to be doing me a favour in helping in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, you can catch up with me in between these shows on social media, or you can join my private Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I've got a special bonus for you to say thank you for subscribing. Just go to podcast 
podcastbonus.com.au. There's a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where I've got a bunch of ebooks and reports. That's my way of saying thank you to you for taking the time to listen. Oh, by the way, if you haven't listened to the many, many podcast episodes we've already got, we're well into our 600s of episodes now. You can always listen to the old episodes, which each have lessons about property investment, success, and money. Once again, thanks for listening to today's show. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 